Okay, we're in 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, how, to, how to never stumble or fall. Let's turn there real quick and let's pray before we get started. Jesus, again, thank you. Uh, Lord, you're just so good to us. And uh, Lord, I know I always start my prayers with thank you, but um, you're worth thanking. Um, you've been so awesome to us. You've, you've blessed us in so many ways. And Lord, a, a lot of times we get into situations where um, we're having a hard time and we can't figure out what we need to be doing and what we don't need to be doing and, and uh, why, do, why we don't feel like we're right with you and, and all of those things. And Lord, I thank you that um, in your word that you've made it clear um, that there are things that we can actually do uh, to keep ourselves in your will and uh, to keep ourselves from having a walk that's not unfruitful. And so, Lord, as we talk about some of those things this, this evening, we pray that um, you just be speaking to our hearts and that you'd encourage your people and that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Second Peter chapter 1. Um, we started this last week, and, uh, but let's go through and read it real quick. Um, verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He goes on and says, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it's right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. This is just a cool passage because you have this promise here. I, I, I just um, love uh, what it says um, in um, verse 10 be even uh, more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And so many times when you, know, when you, when you look at a Christian's life, there are all these things that we get into and all these things that we mess up in and you know, we, we, you know, people fall by the wayside and it's one of those things where um, I, I look at those things, I've, I've seen them in my own life and I'm just like, how did I get here? How did this happen to me? What went on? And... Um, I think that, that many times, actually, I, I don't think this, I know this. When I, um, when I talk to people um, who've gone through hard times and who have even walked away from the Lord, a lot of times they're, they're just like, this came on me out of the blue, and you know, I, I don't really understand how I got here. I don't understand why God would allow this to happen, and all that kind of stuff. And you know, the Bible is clear on the fact that God has uh, put um, certain things in his word, put certain issues at the forefront um, so that if you will do them, you'll never stumble. That's just a cool promise. And that's one of the things that we, we talked about last week. We got partway through the study, so I'm just going to give you a, a real quick review. In verse 3, it, says, it talks about his di divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The divine power of God is the Holy Spirit. And so when you come into a relationship with God, one of the major things that we need to be paying attention to is the fact that we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit if we're going to do the things that God's called us to do, right? And so it's one of the first things that I pay attention to. You know, whether I'm teaching or whether I'm counseling or whether I'm just, you know, getting up doing work around the house. Sometimes getting up doing work around the house is where I need the Holy Spirit the most because I get so frustrated by things, right? And so I want God's Holy Spirit to be at work in me. It goes on in that passage and talks about the fact that that power is given through um, the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue and by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. 
And so we have, again, these promises in the Bible that we need to be paying attention to. And if we take God seriously on things, then God will, will um, basically show himself to be real. And so this is one of those places. So God says that if you will do these things, you will never stumble or fall. And so that's a, that's a cool promise. Here, here's another one. You know, one, one of the things that happened to me when I was, again, younger, is I realized that God made promises in the Bible and that I could take him at his word. And so one of those promises uh, that is really clear is in um, Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is talking about the whole financial thing. And he says that you don't need to seek after finances. You don't need to go after all these things because after those things, all the Gentiles seek. So we're not to do our life like the Gentiles do where we're always going after money and go, always going after the paycheck. And, and I'm not saying that you don't work because the Bible's clear on the fact that you do work. But my job is not what keeps me um, eating. It's Jesus who keeps me eating. And so it says that you don't have to seek after those things. Actually, Jesus makes it a command. Do not seek after those things, because after all those things, the Gentiles seek. But you seek this. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And what he's just talked about was food and clothing. And obviously, it would include shelter and those things. And so um, when I was younger, um, I didn't have uh, necessarily a steady job because I worked in construction in California. And so those were verses that I took seriously. And I would go before God when I was going to pay my bills. And I'd go, God, I don't have the money to pay the bills. Will you please provide for me? And God would say things to me like so. And um, actually, I'd say, would you please provide for me? And then I'd show him the verse. I did this. I opened it up to Matthew chapter 6, and I pointed to it, and I said, God, you said that you would provide for all my needs. And so, will ya? And then God goes, take a look at the verse. And I'm like, what? And so I look at the verse, and, he, and, and what it says is if that you will seek me first, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to you. And then God would say to me, you've been seeking my kingdom? You've been seeking my righteousness? I go, well, mostly. <laughs> and he'd just do an attitude check on me. He'd do, he'd do a tune-up on me. And then, you know, God would get me in the right place, and then God would provide. And God, God does this stuff seriously. And so when you go through your Bible, pay attention to the promises. And again, we talked about that last week, so I'm not going to beat that one up. It also t t talks about this in this passage that he makes us partakers of the divine nature. Um, he says, again, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And again, one of the things that God is way into is making us like him, making us more like him on a daily basis and, and helping us to be true and real followers of Jesus. And so that's where he's going on things. And so obviously, because that's where God's going on things, he doesn't want you to fall. He doesn't want you to blow it. He wants you to be able to have a secure and strong walk in Jesus. And so he gives, again, this whole, this whole list. Um, we talked last week about the fact that the divine nature is the new birth and um, when it says in this passage that you've escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust, that word for escaped means to escape by flight. It's, like, it's to escape by running. Um, so one of the things that, again, let me, let me just play the, um, uh, God's advocate with you. Are you running from the world or are you toying with it? Because what God wants is people who've escaped the world. We're not supposed to be toying with the world. We're supposed to be running from the world. And so, um, again, we need to keep that in mind. Um, he says, uh, verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And so the first thing that he mentions um, in this list is the fact that we need to have a diligent walk. We need to have a diligent walk. Um, the word diligence means to make haste, to be eager, to do one's best, to take care, to exert oneself. 
And so um, when, we, when we talked about um, salvation last week, we were talking about the fact that when you get saved, it's, it's God who really saves you. You're lost in the world, and you can't come to a relationship with Jesus unless God does work in you. And so it's God doing the work. After you get saved, it's supposed to be God doing the work. And so I got, I got here because of Jesus. I stay here because of Jesus. And I grow because of Jesus. But I'm involved in this whole thing. And so as a Christian, I don't have any business just kind of throwing up my hands and going, well, I'm not going to do anything. More, anything. And God, if you want anything to happen here, then um, whatever, you can do it with me. Because that's not what God's into. What God is into is um, a walk with me. So get that picture. So Jesus is walking, and so am I. And I'm walking beside Jesus. It's not Jesus is walking, and I'm hanging back here in the back someplace going, Lord, help me. You know, God, you know, can you please help me to get over there? And he's like, come here. No, I want you to pick me up, and I want you to, you know. <laughs> and it's like, just walk with me is the deal. So again, there, there needs to be diligence that's involved. And again, you know, it, I, I always get scared when... Um, uh, sometimes I, I think that God shouldn't put the diligent stuff in here because a lot of times we are just works oriented and we will just go out and try to make it happen. And I can't make it happen, but I have to be diligent to go to the one who can. And so when I think of diligence, it's, my, it's diligence in, in keeping myself tight with the Lord, diligence in, in keeping um, uh, that relationship going and that kind of stuff. And so you need to be paying attention to that. But again, the word diligent, the diligence and the idea of a diligence walk, diligent walk means you make haste, you are to be eager, you're to do your best, you're to take care to exert yourself. And so are you doing that? And if you're not, um, God's got other things to deal with, on, with you on than the rest of this stuff that we're talking about. The first thing that God's going to be dealing with you about is, why don't you want me? Why don't you want to be with me? Why don't you want to follow me? That's the first thing that he's going to deal with. And once that gets straightened out and you go, I do, <laughs> then we can move on to something else. And that's where the rest of this um, passage um, uh, begins to get um, kind of cool and, and very interesting. Um, you, the next section here are additions that abound. Um, verse 5, he says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence again, add to your faith virtue. And the implication there is add to virtue knowledge and add to knowledge self-control and add to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and so on and, and so forth all the way down the road. And so these are additions that God has, has called us to besides the fact that I am supposed to be a guy who lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the promises of God, and because of the new nature that God's given me and having a heart that's diligent to stay tight with Jesus. And on top of this stuff, you add these things. And the first thing that he mentions is faith. And so, faith. And uh, again, whenever I talk about faith, um, one of the things that um, I usually have to overcome is the goofy ideas that people come up with when they think about faith. And what, and it, it, it's not confined to people that aren't me, because I had the goofy ideas too. And I don't even know where I got them from, because I, I didn't grow up in a Christian family. And so I, when I first started hearing about having faith in the Lord, I really thought it was believing things that are unbelievable just because. And that is not what faith is. What faith is, is trust. And it just means trust and reliance upon God. So if you tell me that you have faith, my immediate question is going to be, you have faith in what? What do you have faith in? And so some people have faith in their job. Some people have faith in their friends. Some people have faith in their mom. Some people have faith in, you know, you, 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 people have faith in all kinds of things. But the faith that we're supposed to have is a trust and a reliance upon God. And so this is, this is one of the things that, um, again, I, I pay attention to the older I get in the Lord. Um, when, I, when I was first a Christian, I knew nothing. And so, uh, you know, I, I was really out there in the sense of really trusting God because I didn't know anything. And so, God, if, you're gonna, if something's going to happen here, you're going to have to do it. I don't know what to do. And so I would trust him. And um, when I would have a question about something, 
Um, I had been told that the answers were found in the Bible, but frankly, I didn't know where to look. And so I would sit down with my Bible and I'd pray and I'd go, Jesus, I don't know what to do in this situation. Will you please show me in your word what I'm supposed to be doing? And I would open up my Bible, and you guys, you guys probably know how that goes. A lot of times I would open up my Bible straight to a passage that dealt with my issue. And I'd read it and I'd, I'd go, whoa, there it is. That's what I'm supposed to do. And I, you know, I'd be all kind of excited about it because I kind of knew it was miraculous. It's like, wow, you know, out of, out of all the pages in the Bible, you know, I, I get to the page that deals with my issue and I'm going through and I'm, I'm looking at those things. And, you know, and so I kind of thought that that was miraculous, but then I also kind of thought that every Christian does that. And then what I found out was that every Christian doesn't do that. And a lot of times what they're, what they're doing is they're going to books that they find in the Christian bookstore. They're, you know, they're, they're going to a bunch of different friends with a def- bunch of different opinions and, and that kind of stuff. And they're not really, uh, you know, their trust is in, some, is in someone or something other than, than, than the Lord. That's really the problem. And so I am supposed to have an absolute trust and reliance upon God. And so, when, again, one of the things that I look at in my own life, and again, I said, especially as I get older in the Lord, one of the things I look at is who am I really trusting in? Am I trusting in my experience? Because now I've been a Christian since 1975. It's over 40 years now. And now I know my Bible because I'm a pastor. And not only do I know it by reading it, but I know it by outlining it and teaching it. And so I know the Bible really well. And if I want to, if I want to get answers from God, I can go straight to the passages that speak about my issues and, and get whatever answer I want to. Right? I can do that. And stuff. Actually, there are passages that I refuse to memorize. Uh, most of the stuff in the um, in the Gospels, I don't want to memorize the Gospels. I like picking up the Gospels and going through them, and it's new, even though I've seen it before. It's like because I don't remember where everything's at, and so it's new. And it's the same thing with the Psalms. I don't like memorizing the Psalms. I like picking up the Psalm, you know, picking up the Book of Psalms and going through it. And Jesus just speaks to me out of the Word. Just did did happen uh, the other day as. I'm having, uh, having some, some time in prayer in my office, and I was asking uh, the Lord about a specific thing, and I pick up my Bible, and I go to Psalms, and uh, actually I asked the Lord where I was supposed to be reading. And so I picked up, pick up the, my Bible, and you know, it's all safe when I'm in my office by myself because none of you know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know? and, and so I asked, asked the Lord where I'm supposed to be reading, and he told me a Psalm, and I went to it, and boom, it was exactly what I needed to hear and exactly um, it fit the, fit the situation precisely. And God does that stuff. And that's what I want. I want, I want to walk with God where it's really him that I'm trusting in, really, really him that I'm relying upon. It needs to be him, not my experience, not my wisdom. You know, I've got some experience and I've got some wisdom in areas and it needs to not be that. I want Jesus to be, again, the one that's guiding me. And, you know, I'm, I'm not tossing out my brain I know that God gave us a brain for a reason, but I really do want to trust in God. So do you trust him? Do you trust him? And if you're trusting in other things, um, many times those other things are the specific things that can make you stumble. So I've read lots of Christian books and I pretty much stopped reading Christian books. And it's not because I'm snooty. It's because you know most of the stuff that um, is, is really good is really old, and I've, I've already got it, and I read those. And I don't, you know, I don't usually go pick up a new Christian book unless it's highly recommended, unless it's highly recommended, and then, and then I'll get some. But I don't want to trust in, you know, trust in the wisdom of, of Christians necessarily. I want to trust in the wisdom of the Lord. My favorite Christian authors are always the guys who, when I read a chapter, I want to put their book down and go read my Bible. Those are my favorite Christian authors. When, when I um, pick their book up and I read it for 15 minutes, I want to get on my knees and go talk to Jesus. Those are my favorite authors. A.W. Tozer. Every time I pick up a Tozer book, I go through and read a chapter. And I'm just like, oh, Lord. <laughs> and I just want to go get my Bible and read it because he's so good. There's a couple of other guys like that. The, um, that, I, that I really love. And so I want to put my, trust, my faith and my trust in the Lord. And so that's the first one. Then he says, 
um, to uh, adding, uh, add to your faith virtue. And virtue is, is one of those words that we don't use um, a whole lot anymore. In fact, I've, I haven't heard anybody use it um, except for out of the Bible. The word virtue um, literally means moral excellence or purity. Um, Vine, in um, Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament words, says that virtue is the manifestation of his divine power. And um, another uh, one of his uh, definitions is that it's courage, power, strength, and purity. So think knights in shining armor. That's virtue. Some, somebody who is strong and somebody who um, is powerful, but somebody who is all, also pure. Somebody who has courage, but somebody who is pure. And that's something that Christians are supposed to have. If I, you know, and, and again, the place where you get that isn't by just making it up. If I really am hanging out with God, is God virtuous? Does he have strength? Does he have power? Is he pure? Yeah. And the more that I hang out with the Lord, the more that I'm going to become like him and I'm going to become a virtuous man. When I think of a virtuous man or a virtuous woman now, I think of people with integrity. I think of people who have honor. I think of people who do their best to do the right thing. And I don't expect people to be perfect. I've never expected that. Actually, I did when I was first a Christian. I expected all the pastors to be perfect. But God disabused me of that notion very quickly. <laughs> yeah. but, I, but I expect people to, um, who are Christians and who are following, following the Lord to have some kind of integrity. And to tell the truth. You know, um, I had some uh, interactions uh, with some people um, a while back. And um, we were talking about telling the truth. And one of the things that they said to me was, nobody tells the truth all the time. And I, I understand the, the point behind it, that every single one of us has lied at some time in our life. But when you give your life to Jesus, lying is supposed to go out the door. And we're supposed to be people who tell the truth. And... Um, you know, I haven't lied to my wife. And I've been married for how long now? 34 years? I haven't lied to my wife. I don't lie, my, I don't lie to my kids. Never lied to my kids. And um, I don't lie to my friends. Don't lie. And actually, I don't lie to you. <laughs> I just don't lie. You know, because um, even, um, and, and it's not that I haven't lied. Because there have been times that I have. The, the, the most notable time that, that I remember was when I first moved back up here. And that's an old story. But um, I, when I first moved up here, um, I was working uh, on a construction crew. And some of you guys already, already know the story. And I'm, so I'm going to make it real brief. Driving back from Hermiston, working on a construction crew. I was starting a, a, a Bible study. Actually, we were starting the church. And one of the guys in the crew asked me if I was ordained. Okay, and so I said, well, basically this is what went through my mind. I wasn't ordained. I didn't have the piece of paper. And what I was waiting for was we had to get all our articles of incorporation together and stuff like that because I wanted the guys who ordained me to be the elders from this church. Okay, and so I, I hadn't done it yet and I didn't want to go through that whole thing with the guy. And so basically what I did was I just went, yeah, I'm ordained. And you know what? It's true, because ordination doesn't come from a little piece of paper that somebody signs and says you are ordained. Ordination comes from the Lord. And the only thing that the little piece of paper is for is to let everybody know that there is a group of people who have recognized that God's hand is on you and that you are obviously ordained. It's not the piece of paper that ordains you. And so I could go through and I could make up all kinds of rationalizations and stuff like that to say that, yes, I told him the truth. I did not tell him the truth, I told him I was ordained and he's talking about the piece of paper. And so as soon as I do that, as soon as I go, you know, I kind of pause for a second, I went, yeah, I'm ordained. And as soon as I did that, God goes, what did you just do? I'm like, I'm, I'm driving, and you know, these guys are clueless about what's going on. I'm, I'm like, what, what? He goes, you lied. God goes, you lied. And I go, oh, yeah, Lord, I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? And he goes, make it right. 
I'm like, oh! You know, and all this is happening in 10 seconds. And so I say, yeah, he's good. There's, a, there's like a 10 second pause. And I go, you know what? I just lied to you. And he goes, what? And so then I go through this whole explanation, all of which I just told you. I'm up here, and this is what's happening, and this is what ordination actually is, and da-da-da-da-da. So I tell the whole thing, and he's just kind of sitting there. The other guy is on the other side of him. It's three guys in the, in the front of this truck. And, and they're looking at me, and they're both looking at each other. I can see them out of my corner of the eye, out of the corner of my eye. And, he, and I get done with this whole thing, and I go, you know what? I'm absolutely sorry. I shouldn't have said that to you. And he goes, seriously, you didn't have to say that. And I go, well, yeah, I did, because I shouldn't have said that to you. And, and so um, he's like, okay. And you know what happened with that? From that point on, that guy absolutely believed everything that I told him. Because he knew if I fudged anything, that I was going to feel so guilty that I had to come and make it right. And so be, be pure. We need to be pure. And when you, when you mess up, and you fail in the area of moral excellence and purity, what you do is you make it right. And when you live that way, then um, uh, things, some things change. You know, there's a, there's a passage in Ephesians chapter 6 where it talks about the armor of God. And it says that we're to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And uh, a lot of times when guys teach in that, they talk about the righteousness of Christ and how that's transferred to us. And that's all true. The reason I'm going to heaven is because Jesus traded places with me. His righteousness gets transferred to me. That's not what Ephesians chapter 6 is talking about. What Ephesians chapter 6 is talking about is if you want to win in your battles against um, Satan, against the enemy, one of the things that you're going to have to have is a righteous lifestyle. Because if you don't have a righteous lifestyle, you're a target all the time. Satan comes up to you and goes, oh yeah, you follow Jesus? Well, what about this? You, you lied. What about this? You cheated. What about this? You stole from the grocery store. Remember when you were going through the grocery store and the lady gave you the change and it wasn't exactly, it wasn't the right change and she gave you an extra $10 bill. Remember that? You walked out and went, bonus, you're a thief, you know? And, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. Satan just jumps on you about those things. And so it's important as a believer that we have a righteous lifestyle. It can't be the kind of thing where um, I just talk about the righteous, oh, I'm, I'm saved by grace, and I'm saved by the grace of Jesus, and so it doesn't matter what I stink and do to all the people who are around me. You don't get to live that way. And so there needs to be a, a practical righteousness. There's a passage in um, Proverbs 28.1. It says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And so you want to have the, the kind of boldness that God wants you to have, you, you know? It's like, it's like you um, do your best um, to put the breastplate on. Do your best to put the breastplate on. And so you have that. Then you have, um, it goes on to say, um, add to your virtue knowledge. Now, knowledge in Greek is the word gnosis, and it's just the, the, the word for knowledge. Um, uh, and that can be speaking about a general knowledge, or it can be speaking about a deeper, more perfect knowledge such as belongs to the more advanced. I got that from a, from a uh, definition out of a dictionary. Um, and most likely, obviously, what it's talking about is a more perfect knowledge. More perfect knowledge of what? Jesus. What else? The word? Yeah. Um, how all this stuff goes? You need to have a uh, more perfect knowledge of the, of the Bible because... You know what, frankly, you guys, you don't know what you're doing. You have no clue. You don't know what to do. You're a bunch of messed up units. And so am I. We're all sitting on this planet doing all kinds of crazy things. And God is the only one who actually knows how we're supposed to be doing things. And I, I seriously um, take, take him like that. And I, you know, I've, I've been going through this thing for um, probably about six months to about a year. Um, I think people on this planet are crazy. I think everybody's crazy. I think I'm crazy. 
You know, um, and again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but you know what? It, it started when everything in the culture just kind of started falling apart and people start talking about civil war. And I've literally had guys um, come up to me and go, what are we going to do when the culture collapses? Steve, you're the pastor of the church. We've got a lot of resources out here, you know, and that kind of stuff. When, I, when we bought the ranch, there were people who came up to me and said, good place to hide out when it all falls apart. That's how, that's how what we bought the ranch for. And actually, I don't think that's a good place to hide out when everything falls apart. It's in a canyon. They can march right up the canyon and shoot you. You know, so I would pick, a, you know, someplace on top of a hill somewhere. But, um, you know, I, I was thinking about all that. And I was like, well, if, you know, if things fall apart, it, it's like I got stuff. So I got a well. I got a well I can get water out of. And, uh, you know, it's an it's a irrigation well. So I could dip a bucket in like old times and I can get water out of it anytime I want to. So I got all the water I need. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about the, you know, the, the water company and all that kind of stuff. So I've got water. I've got a generator. And so I can um, make my um, freezer last for a period of time. Got a bunch of meat in there because we have animals and we slaughter. And so I got, I got some food there. I've got some, you know, we've got other food stored up. I got four acres, I, you know, and I've got water. And so I can plant a good garden and, and that kind of thing. And so my family's taken care of. You know what's going to happen if all the culture falls apart and I have all that stuff? Yeah, somebody's going to come and try to steal it from me. They're going to shoot me. So now I got a gun up. And you know what? I have guns too. You know, it's like I, I, have, I have guns that are like fun guns and I have guns that are like hunting guns and stuff like that. So I've already got the guns and you know what else I'm, I'm going to have to do? Build a wall. I'm going to have to build a wall because all the crazy people are going to come and try to take my stuff. And so here I am, I'm a believer and I have to gun up, build a wall, shoot people because they're hungry and they want my stuff. People are crazy. That's what I'm telling you. It's all crazy. And then I start thinking about history in general, and that's what all of history has been. Some guy goes off, finds himself a plot of land, uh, builds it up so that he can provide for his family, take care of everything, and then somebody else comes along and goes, I want that. And he has two choices. Either he gives it up, and goes and starts someplace else, if they'll let him, most likely they'll kill him. If you're talking about history, he can go start, start someplace else, or he can defend it. And then he's off killing other people. Imagine this from heaven. It's like, you got the whole planet. Everybody, you know, we got the whole planet. It's, not, it's still not filled. Got seven billion people. There's all kinds of areas around here that don't have any people in them. So we got the whole planet, and people are still trying to take stuff from each other. I, and so, we're all crazy. We're, it's a crazy world. And so, you know, um, we need to know what God has to say about how our lives are supposed to go. Because, once again, we're all messed up units, and you have no clue how your life is supposed to go. And neither do I. And so that's why we pay attention to the Word. We've got to have a deeper knowledge of the Word where we actually take what God has to say seriously. And if you don't take it seriously, what you're going to have is all kinds of conflict and all kinds of craziness and all kinds of, you know, and it, it just cracks me up when Christians make excuses for not paying attention to the Bible. You don't get to do that. So a deeper knowledge. If you have a deeper knowledge of, of what God has to say, who, what the Lord's like and what his word has to say, um, then your life is going to be absolutely different and you will not stumble. Here's a passage in Acts 20:32. Paul's talking to the elders at Ephesus and he says, so now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. If I will pay attention to the word, then God is going to use it to build me up and to strengthen me in my life, okay? And so then he says in, in this, uh, again in this passage, and to knowledge, verse six, self-control, self-control. And so that's the next one. Um, Self-control is a term that literally means holding your passions and desires in check. Um, uh, the Greeks um, specifically use this of sexual passions. And so I am supposed to be one who masters my desires and passions, especially the sensual appetites. 
And again, you know, when you, when you look at the times when Christians fall, how often is it in the area of sexual sin? And so I know all, ki- all kinds of guys um, all down through my life. You know, like I said, I've been a Christian for quite a while now. And I've known all kinds of guys who started out well, but what ended up happening was they just destroyed their lives for 10 minutes with a woman. Or maybe multiples of that destroyed their lives. And not only destroyed their lives, but destroyed the lives of their wives and the lives of their children. And um, many times, uh, in some instances, it was the lives of all the people in their churches. Um, specifically talking about pastors. You know, when I, when I was a young pastor, um, I was uh, um, an assistant pastor down in Big Bear. And the place where we had started the church was a place where there had been another church there. And in this other church, they had two different pastors who caused um, some real problems. The church only had like 75 people in it. And the, the problems that came from these guys had to do with, um, first, it was sexual immorality amongst the leadership. They were literally um, swapping wives, literally, and thinking that the Bible okayed that. And so they obviously got really weird, started swapping wives. One of the pastors, I I had a good friend um, up there, actually, um, he's one of the first guys that I worked with when when I moved up there. And uh, he had been following the Lord for a period of time, then he got involved in this church. And when I started working with him, he wasn't following the Lord anymore. Had some real problems. And so we talked about it, and it was because one of the pastors had propositioned his wife. Just craziness. And so... That went on for a period of time, and then they got rid, of, got rid of that pastor, and the next one came in, and he was molesting children. So first we have guys who are swapping wives, and then we have guys who are molesting children. And it was just wild how that stuff in a group of 75 people just totally wiped people out. And actually, um, the guy that I'm talking about never really got over it. He, he really had some problems, and it ended up... Uh, doing stuff in his marriage and things like that. And it just lasted and lasted and lasted. You, you know, we, we are not to be messing around with sexual immorality. Um, the, the Bible is clear on this stuff. It doesn't matter what the world says. Those people are clueless. We're all clueless. They're, but they're really clueless. Because at least I've read my Bible a little bit. You know, I know, I know some of the basics. And so... We're not to be messing around with that because it's stuff that, you know, actually Paul in in Corinthians says, you know, every other sin that you do, it's on the outside. But when you sin in the area of sexual immorality, you sin against your body. And it's like, like, as, as far as God's concerned, all sin is the same in the sense that it can all be forgiven. There's nothing that we've ever done that can't be forgiven. And there's nothing that we've ever done that is more heinous than another thing as far as God's concerned. And for some people, that's a real blessing because um, we have done really heinous things. And it's good to know that God doesn't look at my heinous things any worse than he does your lie or your, you know, bad attitude or things like that, right? And so that's good to know. How about the other, how about the other extreme when you go from the other way? My lie or my bad attitude is just as heinous as murder as far as God's concerned or perversion or molesting a, molesting a kid. And so when you're, when, you're, when you're looking at sin from heaven's perspective, it's all the same, and God forgives it in exactly the same way. But when you look at sin as far as its consequences, there are sins that have, other, have, have consequences that are far deeper than others. And so, like I said, I lied to my, to my buddy who, was, who I was working with, and it got, it got fixed within about, you know, a minute and a half. And so there wasn't huge consequences from that. But you can take the same minute and a half and you, you can do something with that that will get you into huge problems um, with a woman or with another man and with your whole family and destroy people's lives forever. You can do the same, you can use the same minute and a half for that. And that's just the different consequences that come with those things. And so the Bible talks about the fact, again, that we are to have self-control. I'm, I'm to be somebody who has 
uh, holds my passions in check, um, like it says. Check this out. This is in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That means being set apart for God's use. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. So when you get in, in, involved in sexual immorality, how are you defrauding your brother? And this is the way that this works. When, when, I, um, when I was born, did God know from the foundation of the earth that my wife was going to be Bobby? Was it his, his design? I can give you some ev- you know, evidence to, to that fact. When, when we got married, um, one of the thing that, things that Bobby was um, searching for was a wedding date. And so she was praying, you know, um, she was praying and reading her Bible and asked God to just give her a date to have the wedding on. And so she's going through Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 6, it talks about the fact that um, when Noah got off the boat, it was the 27th day of the second month. Is that right? When he got off the boat, right? Yeah, when he got off the boat. So anyway... Noah gets off the boat the second day, or the, the second month, the 27th day. And so um, the Lord says to Bobby, that's the day that you're supposed to get married. And she was like, okay. And so she checked on the calendar real quick to see if that was a Saturday. And it was a Saturday. And so that was all cool. And she's like, oh, the Lord showed me that. And then God spoke to her and said, now when you tell Steve that, this is what he's going to say. And then he told her what I was going to say. And so when she comes up and tells me this, I go, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. I didn't actually say that. But I go, Bobby, you know that the months, the the Jewish months are different than our months and all that kind of stuff. And she immediately goes, God told me you were going to say that. And he told me to tell you that this is the date, this is the one that, you know, we're supposed to be doing it on. And so, you know, I'm just messing around. But obviously, God always knew that I was going to be married to her, right? And so when you get married to somebody, the Bible says that your body is theirs and, and, and that their body is yours, right? So her body's mine. And so, you know, when I ask her, can I have a sandwich? Can you get me a sandwich? And she goes, get your own sandwich. And I go, well, is your body mine or is it yours? And she goes, well, it's yours. Well, I want my body to go get me a sandwich. <laughs> I'm just messing around again. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done that, but have I? Did I ever? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so my body's hers, her, her body is mine before and after. And so when you're talking about sexual immorality, what happens is you, you take your body and you give it to somebody else that doesn't own it. It's not theirs. And you know what? It's not yours to give. Not unless it's in marriage. And so the Bible talks about the fact that um, sexual, um, uh, the sexual relationship is supposed to be inside of marriage. And so sexual immorality before marriage is a defrauding of your husband or wife later on. Obviously, sexual immorality after marriage is a defrauding of your husband or wife at the moment. And so that's what, that's what it's talking about. And so not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. So when, um, when I'm talking to people about their, um, their um, dating relationships, you know, the fact that you're dating someone doesn't mean that you're going to marry them, right? Even if, you're, even if you're engaged, because you don't know if God's not going to take you home the day before you get married, Right? So you may be going along, you're going to be engaged, everything's good, that kind of stuff. And God goes, yeah, no, I want you up here. Mack truck hits you and plows you out. And then your wife is going to, you know, the, the, the woman that you're going to marry is going to go on and most likely she's going to marry someone else. And so she's not yours until she's yours. He's not yours 
until he's yours. And that happens um, in the marriage relationship, when you commit yourself to marriage um, and, you know, basically get married. And so um, you, you don't get to give yourself to somebody else because, again, it defrauds other people. And I'm beating that up too much, but you know what I mean, okay? And so we are supposed to have self-control. That was God emphasizing that whole thing. I have no idea what that was. Okay, so we're, we're supposed to have self-control. Then it goes on and it talks about perseverance along with self-control. And so to knowledge self-control, verse six, to self-control perseverance. And the, the word um, perseverance is just a word that literally means to remain under. And it's speaking about trials, going through trials and testings in a God-honoring way. And it's not the idea of um, you just tough it through. It's the idea of heroic, brave patience with which a believer not only bears, but contends. And so I'm not just hacking it through stuff. I'm standing up and I'm doing my best to do the things that God wants me to do, even though I'm going through hard times. So whenever I think of perseverance, I think of David. David's on the run from Saul. He's being accused of all kinds of false, just garbage nonsense. And there are all kinds of people who are hanging out with Saul who absolutely believe that David is the guy that Saul is telling him uh, that he is. David at one point was talking to Saul and he, goes, and he says to Saul, I know that people have been talking to you about me. I know that they've been saying certain things. Saul, they're not true. They are not true. And Saul believes him for a second, and then, you know, he's right back to where he was before. And what you see with David for, for the seven years that he's on the run from Saul, um, for the most part, is a God-honoring perseverance. A God-honoring perseverance. And that's what you want when you're going through trials. Paul, uh, turn over to 2 Timothy uh, chapter um, 2 real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And this is, a, this is a passage that you're familiar with because um, I use it all the time. But, but starting, starting in um, uh, verse 10, oops, I think it's 1 Timothy chapter 2. I messed up. No, it's not. I totally messed up. Wait a second, let me look here. Oh, chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, sorry. Let's go through and read it. Verse 10, it says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, um, what persecutions I endured, and out of them the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, for evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And so Paul talks about issues that happened to him in, um, in uh, Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra. You know what happened in those places? So at Antioch, he goes in and he starts preaching. And he's sharing with, with the Jews and what ends up, and he's in a public place. And what ends up happening is a bunch of Gentiles start getting saved. And so the Jews start getting mad about the whole thing because they don't want the Gentiles to get saved. And so what it says in the passage was that they begin, they begin blaspheming and yelling and screaming and all that stuff. And Paul goes, fine, if you don't want the gospel, guys, I'll go to somebody who does. And so he takes off. Then he goes to Iconium, um, not too long after that. And when he gets in Iconium, again, um, the Bible talks about the fact that lots of people got saved there. And so he spent some time at Iconium. This is um, all in Acts um, chapter 13, verses 44, um, and into Acts chapter 14. So he spends a bunch of time at Iconium, and the same thing happens. Only now what happens is guys from Antioch come up to Iconium to try to resist the gospel. And so Paul's like, okay. And so he moves on. And then he goes to um, uh did I say Iconium? Yeah. Oh, ex oh, yeah, that's right. Um, and so then he goes from Iconium, Iconium to Derby and Lystra. 
And when he gets to Lystra, the first thing that happens is there's a guy who um, is lame and he heals the guy. You know, um, he, the, the Bible says that he sees that the man has faith to be healed. And so he gets healed. He prays for the guy, the guy gets healed. Everybody there is pagan. And so they start thinking the gods have come down among us. And so they, they look at Barnabas, who's with Paul, and um, go, well, he must be Zeus, and Paul must be um, Hermes, which is, me- uh, which is Mercury, the messenger of the gods. You know, the guy with a little um, wing on his feet and all that kind of stuff, wing on his little helmet and, and that kind of thing. So they think that he's Hermes because he's the messenger. And they go, we're not gods, we're just men. What are you guys doing? They wanted to sacrifice to him and stuff like that. So one day they want to sacrifice to him. Then mean, meanwhile, what happens is the guys from Antioch and Iconium, all the guys who'd been resisting Paul, follow him to Lystra. And when they get to Lystra, they convince the same people who the day before had been trying to make the do sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas as gods. They convince them to stone them. And so what happens is Paul gets stoned, and I'm not talking about, you know, in the Washington sense. Um, I'm, you know, I'm talking about they threw rocks at him until they thought he was dead. And when they thought he was dead, they dragged him outside the city and they left him there. And, you know, you can imagine all the disciples praying and going, oh, God, you know, Paul's been taken, you know, and weeping over the whole fact. And then all of a sudden Paul wakes up, he dusts himself off, and he walks right back into Lystra. And then he, then he leaves the next day. And that's what he's speaking about in that passage. There are times when you're going to go through hard times and actually you're going through the hard times despite the fact that you really are in the will of God. So what are you going to do with that? Are you going to have a bad attitude, turn around and walk away? God, I'm doing everything that you want me to and look at what's happening to me. Because Paul said, if you want to live godly in Christ Jesus, you are going to suffer persecution. Was Paul a godly guy? Yeah, did he get persecuted? Yeah, did God protect him from it? He says so. You've carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And so sometimes God's deliverance is preventing you from going through those things. And sometimes the deliverance of God is allowing you to go through those things, but not allowing them to stop you, not allowing them to destroy you. And so, you know, you have to understand that that's going to go on um, as a believer. You know, um, we, we live in a tough place with a bunch of crazy people, right? Like I was talking about before, the whole, the whole world is mad. And so we live in a place where, where people just do things and they are not thinking straight. And um, God's God's put us here, and we need to be able to endure it. We need we need to be able to get through it. Um, you know, I was a sports guy when I was a kid. I was an athlete and stuff. And this is something that's absolutely familiar to me. You know, you're gonna you're going to play a sport, and when you get to the end of the game, it's going to get really hard, and you're not going to feel like it anymore. And you're going to want want to walk off the field. And the difference between an athlete and a quitter is whether, you not, whether or not you stay on the field. And you don't want to be a quitter, right? And so you're going to go through things. So persevere, persevere. And then he says to perseverance, you add godliness. And um, godliness is kind of an interesting word. It comes from uh, two words in Greek, you, um, eu, which, is, which means well, and subomai, which means worship. And godliness means to worship well. Worship well. People who are godly are people who worship well. And I'm not talking about people who sing loud, um, you know, during the worship service or raise their hands or or stuff like that. It's the idea of a life that's been given over over to the Lord. And it's it's a life that actually sees God as somebody that is worth worshiping. Let me put it uh, to you in the etymological sense. It's worth ship. So a lot of times we think of worship as singing songs. Worship in the Bible is really looking at God and going, he's worth it. He's worth my praise. He's worth my honor. He's worth my life. And that's somebody who's godly, who, who lives like that. And again, if you, if you do that, 
um, then life will be different. It's a recognition of the dependence and confession of honor given in certainty that we need the favor of God. And so that's, that's godliness in that passage. And then it says to godliness, you add brotherly kindness. Let me get back to the, to the passage here. Um, to godliness, brotherly kindness. And brotherly kindness um, is where we get the word Philadelphia. It means love of, love of brothers is, is literally what it means. It, it, um, actually, um, Phila, Delphia, Delphia is where we get the term, it, it's, it, it's a term brother in Greek. Um, Philly, phila, um, that we have in the word Philadelphia, comes from the Greek word phileo, and it means a love that likes people. It's kind of a friendship type of love. And so this isn't the, the word agape. This is a word where it means that you are around people and you like them. So I don't get to do the thing where I go to church and I look at all the people and I go, some of you I just really love. And some of you, eh, not so much. <laughs> you know? it's, a, it's like I love you but I don't like you. You ever heard anybody say that? I love you, but I don't like you. You're allowed to say that to teenagers. Because <laughs> there, there's some truth to that. <laughs> but you know what? You know, when you're, when you're, looking, at, when you're, when you're looking at people uh, um, in the fellowship, uh, we need to have an affection for brothers, uh, an affection for brothers and sisters. Um, Peter said it in his first book this way, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. See the phrase sincere love of the brethren? That's that word. It's a, it's a word, Philadelphia. And so we need to have an affection for people. If you don't have an affection for people, then you can start getting an attitude towards people. And um, usually when, when somebody is going to, um, when somebody gets to the point where they can be so rotten to people, you know, that, you know, in, in some of the instances that we see in our culture, it's usually because what they've done is they've separated themselves from them and they've demonized them. And so they don't become real, they're not real people anymore. They are this thing. And, you know, it, it, it becomes uh, uh, disgust towards a group or things like that. And so you don't want to do that with people. You want to have an affection for the brothers. There's a passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that says that one of the things that we're supposed to do is uphold the weak. And it's the, it's the idea of all those people who are socially inept and don't know how to act in front of you and they're just frankly weird. That's what it's talking about when it's talking about the weak. And so you don't get to look at the weak and go, oh, they're weird. I don't want to have anything to do with them. You know, we've had um, issues with, with our kids over, over time. Dad, those people are weird. They come up to me and they say things to me. They don't know me, you know, <laughs> and that kind of stuff. And, we, you know, we tell our kids, hey, you know, you just need to be kind to them. And I go, well, this person did, did this thing. And I go, yeah, yeah, you know. They're, they're. Actually, Bobby does more of this than I do. Yeah, that's kind of weird. I understand. And so, you know, you're still supposed to like them. You're supposed to, still supposed to love them. And so be kind to them. I have, I have a son that's really kind. Sometimes he have, has real attitudes. I get to see those things. But he's really kind. And so when I think of brotherly kindness, a lot of times I'm thinking of, of, my, of Nathan. And, you know, it's the same thing with Bethany. She's, she's pretty kind to people, too. And in, in any case, case um, brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness, love. And that word love there is the word agape. And that's the, that's the highest form of love. That's the, that's the type of love that God has for us. It's not always used, um, just so that you know this, it's not always used in the context of God's love for us or a godly love for other people. Sometimes it's used of non-believers just loving their stuff. But it's the idea of the, the highest form of love. And so for a Christian, the highest form of love is not to be pointed at stuff. It's to be pointed at people. And, and uh, so, again, we need to keep that in mind. It says, uh, this is a definition, it's that divine love which God is, as to his nature, which is produced in the heart of the yielded believer by the Holy Spirit, and which impels him to deny himself for the benefit of the one loved. 
You can always tell when somebody loves somebody this way because they deny themselves. That's the way that, you know, again, that is supposed to go. Okay, so he goes on in the passage. That's the whole list, and that's a great list to go through and check yourself out on and that kind of stuff. And if you don't have those things, go to the Lord and, so, and say, Jesus, you've got to do this in me. But if you look in verse 8, it says, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be the, neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I agree, don't you think? You know, so if you have a real trust in God and you have a real honor and integrity and you have a real knowledge of the word, a kind of knowledge that makes you do it, if you are um, somebody who lives your life with some kind of self-control and you persevere through um, trials and you have a heart towards God where he's worth every, every ounce of your worship and more, and you have a heart towards people where you actually kind of like them, and then on top of that, you would give yourself for them. You got that kind of lifestyle, and what's going to happen is you're not going to be unfruitful in um, the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on in verse 9, he says, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. That's, again, something that we need to keep in mind because there can come a point where you're so used to the word of God that you forget this stuff. This is stuff that, that's, that, that's brand new to you when you first become a Christian. Oh, yeah, this is the lifestyle I want. This is what I've never had. This is what I need to be like and, and that kind of stuff. And then you get used to it and you deal with people and, and sometimes they're not like this. And so you get a little um, hardened to it. Um, uh, uh, actually, a guy came up to me uh, today, um, after I was talking about that letter thing, and he goes, are you bulletproof yet? And I know exactly what he means. And um, I was like, you know, no, I, actually, I, I kind of don't want to be. You know, I had, um, I had some guys uh, who were friends of mine who were in the fire department down in L.A., and they get called out to, to all these um, situations where people have been shot or been hurt or you know, just all these really gross situations. And the guy that I'm thinking about was uh, an EMT um, on, on the unit. And, I, you know, one time I was talking to him, I said, how do you handle all that stuff? And he goes, you know what, Steve, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed, but I get, I get hardened to it. I get hardened to it. And so it's just another day at work. And um, when he said, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed, I knew exactly what he meant. And I, you know, you don't want to be in a position where you get like that. This, this needs to be the Jesus thing, and it needs to be a for real thing, and it needs to be like that all of your life, all your life. You're with Jesus and you're following him. Um, don't, don't be blind. Don't be short-sighted. Don't forget that you were cleansed from your old sins. Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And diligence again uh, in the passage. Uh, make your calling and election sure. Here's the point of this. You know, there are times when, you, when, when stuff happens in your life and you doubt your salvation. You ever been, been in that situation? Am I really saved? Do I really know Jesus? And usually this happens to people when they're younger Christians. And when, when people um, come to me and say, Steve, I don't even know if I'm a Christian, you know what I, what I, uh, what I do with them? One of, the, one of the things that I do with them is I show them the verses that talk about the fact that when you give your life to Christ, he's not going to just get rid of you. You know, there, there's an assurance of salvation. If you're in Jesus, you're going to heaven. First John chapter 5, go read the chapter. Um, if, you're, if you're in Christ, then you're a believer and God's got you covered. And then the second thing that I, that I do with them is I ask them, what did you do? Because that's the issue. They did something and they stepped out of line and they think it's too far and they don't even know if they're a Christian anymore, right? And so again, if you, if you have your focus on these things, the positive things, the, the fact that I, I want to um, trust God and the, I, I want to know him and I want to know his word and, and all the things that we've talked about, um, it will be a situation where you don't sit there thinking about whether or not you're a Christian anymore. And here's another thing. Um, it, it says in this passage, for so an entrance, verse 11, um, will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's an abundant entrance that comes for people who will do this, 
And what is he talking about when he's talking about an entrance? It's talking about when you go home to be with the Lord. Do you want an abundant entrance? Where, you know, it's like you, you come into the presence of God and God go, and you know, and Jesus goes, Steve, you're here. Well, he's not going to say that because he always knew it. But you know, you know what I mean? I'm so glad that you're here. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah, you know that one thing you did? Not so great, but most of it. Well done. Good job, man. Come on in. Do you want that kind of entrance? Or do you want the kind of entrance where it's like, oh, hi, come on in, I died for you, yeah, yeah, you're a little iffy there, yeah, you got some reasons to be, come on in, you know, that, that kind of thing where you're just kind of hanging your head and wondering if you're supposed to be there or not, you want an abundant entrance, you want to win, is the deal, um, and so if you're going to do that, um, you have to, you, you, you have to do it right, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 9.24, I'll end it with this. It says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, He's talking about shadow boxing. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I'm, I myself should uh, become disqualified. And so when Paul looked at his walk with God, he looked at it as a race. And so, um, you know, again, I was a sports guy. Um, after my, my senior year in high school, um, I went to a JC so that I could play football specifically. And all summer long, every other day, we had a, a hill in our town called Mount Rubido, and I lived not too far away from it. And every other day, all through the summer, and, and you know, Southern California can get hot and it's smoggy, but every other day, I ran up the top of Mount Rubido. And so it went around, the road went around the mountain. So it went, let's see, started it here, went around once, went around twice, and then it came up to the top, and then there was a cross up at the top, and I'd always run to the cross. Yeah, I was a young Christian. And so that's what I did every other day. And what I was doing was getting ready for football. And the reason that I was doing that is because I knew that I was going to be competing against a bunch of guys from a bunch of other schools. And I knew that I was going to be competing a bunch of, against a bunch of guys who were in their second year on the team. And I knew I was going to be competing against a bunch of guys who were in the third year on the team because they'd redshirted. And I wanted to play. And so I wanted to win. And so I needed to be in better shape than everybody else on the team. And so that's what I did. Because I don't do things, I wasn't doing um, something in a way um, in which I wasn't going to obtain it. Again, look at the passage. One receives the prize, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. And so we do that for, in, uh, for perishable crowns or for perishable rewards, by like, like starting on a football team. Um, but as believers, we're doing it for an imperishable crown when we're standing before Jesus. And so you're in a race, run it. Got to do the training, got to do the basics. And if you, and, and if you do them, then, then things are going to be good. And if you're not doing them, then things are going to be hard. Way of the transgressor is hard, is what it says in Proverbs way the transgressor transgressor means you're not doing what God wants you to do and you know it the way the transgressor is hard so don't do that do this so isn't that cool that's a that's a great passage actually it's my my wife's favorite bible study and she made me do it so <laughs> we're going to be in second peter again next week so that's it let's pray get you out of here all those of you that want to get out of here and then we'll talk about the letters. So, Jesus, thank you uh, again for your love for us. Thank you for the fact that you provided a way uh, for each one of us to have the kind of walk that you've called us to. Thank you, Lord, um, that you, you don't expect us to, to just eke it through. Um, you've provided a way that we can abound and um, that, that we can just have a blessed life. And so, God, we just pray that in those um, areas where um, we have shortcomings, uh, Lord, that you would encourage us in those areas, uh, make us more like you. 
And uh, in the areas where we're doing well, um, God, just pray that you would encourage us and that we would continue. Um, But Lord, we know that all of this, all of this depends on you. Thank you, Jesus, for the power that you give us. Thank you, Jesus, for the strength that there is in in being with you, just being with you. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to, to be that, be with you. And we ask that you do this all in your name. Amen. Okay, God bless you.